It's no accident that the Atlantic is in Abu Dhabi. It's one of the world's most vibrant business centers, but it's also the Middle East, considered one of the most volatile regions. So how do those two things go together? Bus how do those two things go together, business and the reason's re reputation for being a tough place to do business? Someone who has a, navigated the complexity of the, all that is someone whose name you've heard here earlier today. It is Fadi Gondor, founder of Aramex. He's got one of those against all odds stories, sort of a FedEx for the Arab world and beyond, a huge global success. Something went right when Fadi got involved, but is it just him? Or is it the opportunity there for everybody? Please welcome Fadi Gondor and John Donvin, ABC Newsman and a contributing editor to Atlantic Live. <coughs> well, Fadi, I feel like I'm sitting down with a legend. Oh, uh, you are the legend. So oh, I'm, that's I'm not honored. necessarily you're, true. You're doing this. Um, I say that because your story really personifies the issues we're talking about, the time period we're talking about. And to get at that, I want to, to play a little game of one-sentence answers to sort of stake out the ground wow. to tell your story. So in one sentence, answer this question. Tell me about your dad, his era, and what he did in business. So my dad is an, uh, is an entrepreneur, a political activist, a political refugee, uh, built a business uh, uh, out of Jordan, and he's retired now. And he's my mentor. That was two sentences. Sorry. You had a comma. Second question. No commas? <laughs> commas and semicolons are allowed. Okay. Second, my English is not great. That was very clever. <laughs> second, second question, tell me about yourself, your era in business, and what you built. So, uh, so I'm, I'm an, uh, an entrepreneur. I, I built a business in the region for, uh, for the past 30 years. I'm retired now. I'm reinventing myself as a VC. Third question, what is the big, biggest difference between your dad's era and your era? So my dad's era was, it was a tired era, uh, a socialist era, an era that was ruled by, by coup d'etats and, and rule of armies in, in the Arab world, and, uh, and the socialist era. There was no capitalism at that time. It was a bad word uh, to talk about it, and it was an era of the Levant, and an era of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, this is more than a sentence, but that's a big question. So, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the total dominance of the state. And your era, com by comparison? And, and my era is, is a, bit, a bit, well, there's more similarity with my era. So my era is not now, by the way. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm past tense. Right. Right. So uh, my era is, is, uh, is more capitalism, the rise of the Gulf, the rise of oil, the rise of cities, and the beginning of the ex explosion of the youth generation in the Arab world. And the last part of this game, the difference between your era and today. Uh, so today I wrote this because you asked me and I need to, t to say it quite, quite well. If you, you take more than one sentence on so this. So it's one, more one sentence because it is very important that I answer the way so, so this era is, is an important, the most important era we're living in, I think, and, and you need to focus with me a little bit. So we're, we're an era of armies, of youth, educated, connected, mobile, city dwellers, capitalists, and waiting to be counted. Of all these we're still these waiting. My sons are waiting to be counted because they are the majority. 60% of the Arab world is under the age of 25. Which of these eras would so you... So you and I are... Wh are but which of, of these eras would you have wanted to work in Excuse if given me? a choice? If given the choice, which of these eras would you choose now, to work in? Now. Now, now is, is the best. This is the most exciting era. Forget... And, and you're a journalist. Forget what you watch on CNN. This is... This, things are happening in the region. Well, the, the, the point about what we're seeing on CNN. I know that that gets at you. You're very passionate about this yeah, issue. Yeah, I, I don't watch CNN, so with all due respect <laughs> to Amar. No, I don't. Because if I do, I'm, 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 I'm going to be depressed. No, you, your stories are more economic, uh, John, and I love what you do, but, but the sensationalism of, of thinking that the Arab world is only uh, ISIS is, is just driving us nuts here. Why... Why does that perception actually matter for what happens here? Why does that perception in the West of the Arab world, why, why does that... Ajnabiya because you, you are, you know, you're part of the region, so as much as you are the West, but you're here, you're, you're, you're investing here, your armies are here, your politics is here, you, you support the biggest, uh, uh, well, you're a big supporter of Israel, which is here, 
And so you're here. So you, it matters what you think about it because you think we're partnering with us. And not necessarily that we like that partnership sometimes. We love it in other times. You have beautiful things in the US that we, we don't get to see much of. So your armies are here, but Silicon Valley is not here. Why? Why do we see uh, weapons and we don't see Silicon Valley here? Do you, um, do you need the West to be investing? Yes, I mean, but, but because this is a globally connected world. You, and the West cannot, cannot... You can't ignore this region of 400 million people of, of $4 trillion economy that is bigger than India, bigger than Russia, and bigger than, than, uh, than many of the economies around the world that you think are sexy. We, are also, we have a sexy economy. We have a big consumer base. And, and, and your, uh, your Facebooks and, and Twitters and, uh, have more people outside of the United States than you have in the United States. So you'd better pay attention to us. At, at what cost if we don't? What, by the way, when at I what say cost? we... At cost wait, 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 wait. Of, I, when uh, I say we, I don't actually really mean me. So, so, no, so at the they cost, don't. If so they John, don't. <laughs> so the John, John, the cost is you fall into the trap of, of, of little bits of news that pop up uh, pop out from, from northern Iraq or somewhere else and think the rest of the region is like that. I lived, I built my business in a politically turmoil region. I, I don't remember that this region was not politically in turmoil. There is more of it today, but life continues. Uh, we are building uh, countries. Look at the UAE. I mean, look at the incredible miracle of Dubai and Abu Dhabi and, and tell me that this region is not developing. Yes, there's a lot of it that's real estate, but mines are being built. We will, we, we, this is, there has been an education revolution. Also but but you haven't world. answered my so, question. So if, if, the West, if the West doesn't pay attention, if the West doesn't invest, West what, doesn't what, what does the West lose? If, if the West doesn't pay attention or pays attention to one side of the story, then, then, then you, you will fall into that, that trap of, of fulfilling a prophecy that is not necessarily true, which means you think our youth are going to go radicalized all the time, and then the, the, you, you recreate those radicals in many places across the region, and then we're all in more turmoil in the region. So you are invested in here because you are here, and you have to make sure that your soft side is much more here than your hard side. So what you're saying in the consequences, not just for the West, but globally, would be radicalization. Yeah, I mean, we, we will all pay for it. I mean, you, uh, whether we like it or not, you're, you're a heavyweight. You are, you are the big gorilla and, uh, all around the place. So we, you, we, we, you, you need to notice us, and we need to notice you. And we need to have a different type of dialogue here. And we need to have a top-down... A top top, uh, leaders need to talk to you. But there are stories across the region that are not necessarily in the top. So I'm, I'm treading on a political story here. You need to hear what everyone is talking about and doing in the region beyond listening to the political story only. There is an economic story, there is a cultural story, there is a development story to be listened to and participated in in the Arab world. We have hundreds of thousands of Arabs that have graduated from the West mm -hmm. and have learned a lot and entrepreneurship as a concept has, has, has been an, an Islamic and an Arab story for a long time but we got rejuvenated by believing that the guy that actually can have the knowledge and the capability can come back and build the business. This is, this is an American but, but, concept, but, but, you we, know, the underdog. But we heard Dave McClure this morning answer some questions by saying, look, the capital is here, you, you, you know, look, look locally. And that's why I'm coming to the question of, yeah. of your, your mess, you have this message of the West and you have this sort of pleading to the West to get more involved, but I felt I heard Dave McClure saying, you know, it really could be the West be damned, we can do it ourselves, we've got the capital, we've got the talent, we've got the motivation. Well, good, you know, so, so we're, we're doing things here, so we don't need capital. So I, I love Dave. He's a great guy. He's one of the early believers in the startups of the region, and he's investing, and he's taking some of our startups to his accelerator in Silicon Valley. Uh, but excuse me, I mean, we have more money than, than we, need, we know what to do with. So we don't need your capital. We need technology. We need to share knowledge. We need to bring you in here for your knowledge and, and other capabilities than capital. We need to uh, chide ourselves and say, there is no reason, and I'm doing a little study which I'm going to publish very recently, is how much money is it going to build 10,000 startups in the region? And my initial indications, it's a trickle. It's a trickle of, of what's being spent in the region on hardware. You have, this, you have this passion so about... So it's our, our responsibility. We don't want your money. You have this passion about 
youth and, and right now about unemployment, which you see as yeah, the real... This is the biggest challenge, as we talked last night. Yeah. So you can talk about all the political challenges across the region, but these people that are scaring us in, in, in Iraq or in Syria are, are, are 26 years old. So what, what, what is going to happen to them? You know, I was listening to a guy, uh, talking to a guy about the refugees, the Syrian refugees in Lebanon. You know, today, today, there are 430,000, 430,000 school-aged children that are Syrian in, Lebanese, in Lebanon. Only 20% of them are going to schools in Lebanon because the Lebanese school system cannot afford to do that. Jordan has a little less, but it's the same. Mm -hmm. And there are at least 250,000 to 300,000 Syrians that have, are missing two years of education. What's, where are they going to go, you think? What are they going to do? I mean, that's what scares us. And, and, and that's, that's, that's our making. We're not blaming you, but you're also part of the game. You're, you're, you can't exclude yourself. You can't say, I made an election promise. I'm leaving after I created all sorts of mess. And now, bye-bye, Arab world. We're going back home. And now, suddenly, you're coming back. Um. How much of this do I personally embody for you? Because <laughs> this, this is a heavy responsibility. Is, is entrepreneurship... And I don't, I don't bear responsibility to anything I am saying either. I know, I know. <laughs> How much is, is local entrepreneurship actually part of the solution? To, totally. to, the, to the unemployment question. And, and people will think I'm crazy, but I think entrepreneurship is the solution. Meaning, the entrepreneurial mind, not necessarily entrepreneurship as coming out and graduating our kids and telling them we want armies of people that are going to start businesses. As important as that is. So startups create jobs. And as we discussed yesterday, the net increase in jobs, even in the West, comes from companies that are under five years old. So it's important that we educate our kids to, to understand that they can come out and actually build businesses. But more important, when you, when, when you change the education system to an entrepreneurial mind type of an, uh, uh, education, it means you're addressing critical issues, meaning you are graduating people that think problem solving, critical thinking, Challenging the status quo, saying I can do this better, not memorizing the, the answer and think that there's an answer that was, was learned 500 years ago. There is an answer in the 21st century that does not necessarily, uh, has not been discovered. You can go out and discover. The, the entrepreneurial mind is a mind of discovery. It's open. It's inclusive. It is a built in teamwork. This is, these are skills that are learnable. Entrepreneurs are not, are not born. You are, you learn to be an entrepreneur. So you, I was going to ask you whether... So that's what you need. But are, are you an exception or can anybody be you? No, anybody can... What? I don't know. I mean, so <laughs> anybody I, can I, be you. I am not an exception. I see, you know, I am, I'm in the business of early stage tech investing today. I, I see tens and tens and tens of entrepreneurs every single month. I'm not exaggerating now. I, I get at least five or six new emails every single day from entrepreneurs wanting, to, uh, to wanting me to look at their businesses. So uh, they're out there. So why do they come to me? For two reasons. One, because I, they know I've built a business and Aramex is, is, is a nice uh, a brand name that people feel associated with and, and think that I've done something which is miraculous, which is conquering the geography, the, the crazy geography of the Arab world because Arabs cannot build and Arab businesses, except uh, unless they really suffer miserably because it's very difficult to go cross-border. And number two, they come to me because I'm an investor. So if, it, 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 there's no miracle in that. You can, you can combine these two things. The state can be an investor by deploying money through private sector funds that can have better deployment of capital across the region. And number two, changing the education system so that you can get more entrepreneurs and more people that think, if, he, if this guy has done it, others can do it. Samih Tuqan and Hussam Khouri are much more important entrepreneurs than I am. These are the two people that built, that built the most impressive and the biggest internet company in the Arab world called Maktoub. And it is the first time that uh, uh, actually Silicon Valley paid attention to us. This is when Yahoo came and paid $165 yeah, but you're, you're million talking, dollars for you're, a company. But you're talking about, you're talking about everybody who has they succeeded. It, others but can do it. But you're talking about the successes. What about, you know, we talked earlier and today about, about failure. Can you fail here? I have, I have you failed. said you can you you fail and go to jail for failing. Failures. I'm a product of many failures. If I tell you I did everything perfectly, I'd, I'd be lying to you. I'd be, I'd be a big liar. 
I'm a product, many entrepreneurs, many people are products of many failures. Some of them are big failures, some of them are small failures. You learn, I'm a believer that you learn by, by doing, and when you do, you are failing, and multiple failure, failures mean multiple series of experiences that lead you to have resolved a problem that you have tried. Think that you're in a lab, and you're continuously testing things until you find the solution. Right, but, and but this, I, uh, I, I, many failures. I, I, think, I think there's something to be said for the fact that you're here because of your success. If you hadn't had the success, yeah. We'd be I sitting think, talking think, to you, and it would be great. I think, but I think the next time we should bring people who have failed and ha should should share with us that that. Failure. That's actually an interesting. And, and I keep telling people, by the way, if if if, if somebody and I, if there are students here, if if you have tried the business and you failed, you're the first one to be hired in any business that I do. Let's go to some questions. Much more than an MIT MBA, <laughs> or a, or a Harvard MBA. Right in the front here. You have 10 failures? You should come and say, come. <laughs> <laughs> come and tell us about them. Everybody's you're failing. Still here. What happened to you? Did you go to jail? Did anybody shoot you? Who is in, in down front here? Uh, the, oh, here, it's right behind you. Hi, sure. Salma from Young Arab Leaders. So, uh, and we've met Fadi before, hello. So we, my question is in regards to a different problem. You've spoken and you've mentioned um, the youth who are suffering and struggling, and probably entrepreneurship is a great way for them to find alternative ways of employment. But what about a huge segment that exists that is more privileged, let's say, and lacks the motivation and are complacent? Yeah. This is a big problem that we yeah. face in the region. It's, How do we tackle this issue? It's, it's not in everywhere in the region, but it's in certain areas. I say the bigger the safety net, the more worry we have to have about how to motivate these kids. Let's, let's loosen the safety net a little bit. We, we need to fall, we need to, to burn our fingers, and we need our mothers and fathers and the state not to over smother us. Because we, when those of us that grew up and tried things on, on, in Bilharat, you know, Harat street neighborhoods, uh, the streets twice wise kids are the kids that make it much quicker than anyone else. So, and that's because uh, our, our parents let us go down to the street. We live in a society, even my kids, I used to worry about them, even my own kids, used to worry about them work, going to the streets and playing in, in the neighborhood. Uh, I lived my life in, in, on the streets. Uh, or, uh, the state needs to do the same thing. The state needs to tell its, its people, go down to the streets and, and experience life. The state does not, is not gonna be there for you all the time. So yes, I'm, I'm in agreement. Loosen the safety net. Entrepreneurship, again, is about trial and error. And trial and error means the safety net is not there. When error happens, you fall. And then stand up again by yourself. Another question, please? Right in... Uh... Walid al-Bashir. Oh, I'm sorry, Nassim, sir, go ahead. Walid al-Bashir, Stationary INC. Uh, very thank you very much, Mr. Fadi, for your great mentorship. And, uh, uh, my question is, uh, for a startup, we, we see a lot of accelerators right now uh, around the region, and uh, seed funding uh, seems to be uh, going on uh, in, a, in, in a good direction. What about bridging the gap between seed funding and between VC money? Because this is, uh, this is the valley of this. Uh, this is where uh, sure. companies die. Sure, so, sure. so uh, the death valley. Yes. So I'll, I'll, let me give you an example to, di to, to go into diversity. So the Lebanese Central Bank recently issued a directive, about a year ago, a directive making available $400 million. Lebanon, this is Lebanon. Lebanon living in turmoil. The Central Bank issues a $400 million directive to let banks invest through VCs to invest in the Death Valley space, one to six, five, seven million dollars in knowledge economy businesses based out of Beirut, based out of Beirut, guaranteed 75% by the central bank. So the money is deployed through VCs, given by banks, guaranteed by the central bank to invest in knowledge economies. You're gonna see, there are already five funds. Hala Fadl, uh, our good friend, is gonna be talking later today. She is one of the founders of these funds, and it's fantastic. You know, uh, maybe it's a little bit too much, I think, for Lebanon, but that's an incredible thing coming out from the Central Bank of Lebanon. And we only hear about the politics of Lebanon. There is an entrepreneurship story. So, so we need more of those. There's a question in the front here. Hi, uh, my name is Elisa Freha. I represent Wemina, which is a women's angel investors network here in the UAE. 
Um, my Congratulations, question. you've been active and investing. Yes, thank you very much. And you've saved some women and gave them some money to, start to continue building their business. I know what you do. <laughs> well, you were You don't know very me, quickly. but I know you. Oh, thank you very much. That's <laughs> a big compliment. Um, so my question to you is, you said, and, and rightly so, that we don't necessarily need Western capital. There's more than enough capital in the region. But specifically, with so much disposable income available for entrepreneurs, um, for local entrepreneurs to maybe bootstrap or fund their entire projects themselves, how what pieces need to be in place to explain the need for strategic investors to help scale a project? So define strategic investors. Um, specifically, someone like an angel investor who has a network or experience right. or so a different expertise. People like you and your network. People and, like, uh, yes, me and Wamina. You have Noor Suede with you and others yes. who are adding value, yes. So, so, uh, so when I said we don't need Western money, it's because I'm addressing the issues that we need. So uh, Arab money is there. It doesn't necessarily mean it's available for startups. I'm saying it's there. So that's not something that I'm going to be looking for. I need to look in the neighborhood for that money. And Western money or any other non-Arab money will not come in unless it sees my money come in. Why should somebody from New York invest in, in an Arab company when Arabs are not investing? Neighborhood, uh, neighborly relations are more important than, than non-neighborly uh, relations. Now, uh, strategic money is important. Yes, there are VCs and angel investors. That Most of the angel investors that I know are strategic investors, meaning they will come in, they're interested in the space, they want to add value, they've built their own businesses, they're either entrepreneurs that have made it and want to continue building other entrepreneurs, they hold hand, they mentor, uh, they introduce, they open doors, they knock on uh, bringing clients. I mean... It's, it's happening, as you know. I mean, it's buzzing. Is there hundreds of millions of dollars in it? No. But we know from what we've seen across the region, and the, by the way, angel networks, John, exist everywhere. Saudi Arabia has a series of angel networks. I'm surprised at the amount of angel networks that exist in the UAE. In Jordan, there's a huge agent network. I was just in Cairo, and there are hundreds of entrepreneurs and lots of angel networks. We need them to proliferate. We need that $10,000 angel investor to be a $100,000 angel investor so that we can actually fund these companies. And a lot of them will fail. And a lot of them will fail. But that second-time entrepreneur who has failed the first time with 100 k is going to build a million-dollar business. Got the question? Yes, hi. Uh, my name is John Mishriki uh, from Validity, and I have a question from for, from Validity. Okay. And I have a question for you. You talked about the importance of Silicon Valley coming here to the Middle East. Don't you think that uh, the reliance of the Middle East on the West coming here is one of our major problems if we want to be recognized as uh, an innovative region? So I have I have a view on innovation, and people might not like that. My I have a statement that I use all the time. I say copy and paste, and then innovate. Most businesses around the world, if you, if you read the research, are businesses that have been built around other businesses. Innovation does not necessarily mean coming, uh, means that you kind of come up with something that nobody else has ever heard of. It is okay to copy, it's okay to paste, and then start innovating. RMX is a business of copy and paste. We had zero innovation in the very early days. Once we learned the business, once we built our networks, then we were able to come up and customize, localize what, what, products. What were you copying? It's okay. What were you copying? FedEx and, and UPS and, and our competitors. And, and actually, everything I learned in my life in the business was delivering for two American companies. We were the delivery partner for Federal Express and Airborne Express, which doesn't exist anymore as a company. We learned, we learned from the best. And, and, and through strategic alliances, we were delivering their packages and they were teaching us how to deliver those packages. They were teaching us the technology and the whole generation of Aramexians were, were, uh, we grew up learning from the FedExes of this world. And then we came and said, okay, here's what we learned from these people. Here's what they don't understand about this region. And here's how we're gonna innovate about doing this region. And you have a generation of logisticians in the Arab world, by the way, that were graduates of Aramex. They went out building their own businesses or went out and worked for other people. You will find hundreds of them ac across the region. That's what you need to replicate ecosystems of people that have learned from somewhere. It doesn't mean you don't generate indigenous innovation. There is indigenous innovation, but, but the quick way to scale up is to copy and paste and then innovate. There's nothing wrong with it. And it can be from the East, by the way. It can be from China, it can be from Malaysia, it can be from Indonesia. I'm, 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 I'm not saying West. It's just because the West is so dominant in the tech space, 
And, and, we, uh, and if we talk only tech entrepreneurship, and, and I'm a believer that we are in a digitized economy, and everything is, is bricks and, 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 and digital today. So you need to combine both. Another question, please. Hi, I'm Katie Bisbee with DonorsChoose.org. And Fadi, I would love to hear your thoughts on corporate social responsibility and yes. how that's going here. I have a and lot so of maybe, opinion on that. Um, maybe uh, for everyone's entertainment, you can pretend that our moderator is a company that won't invest in the community, and you can tell him what you I think. I would, would much rather be a nice guy in so, that so scenario. Um, <laughs> so, uh, again, I'll... <laughs> I'm going to do a, a, a promotion pitch for Aramex now. So Aramex is the first company in the region and one of the first companies in emerging growth markets that publishes dual, we do the dual reporting. We don't publish only our financials, we publish our, our community and sustainability report in duality. And we, we, we announce exactly what we're going to do and then we get an auditor to audit it and we publish our, our reports on both levels. I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer that you cannot dissociate business from the society. Um, 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 I, I, I think that the uh, Milton Friedman concept of the business of business is only business is just an absolute disaster that led to the, to us, to the need for us to review what capitalism means at the end of the day. And that shareholder value is not the only thing that matters. It cannot be the only thing that matters. You need to look at stakeholder values. People that you touch matter as much as you do. My employees in Aramex, I'm no longer there. I sit on the board. My employees uh, in Aramex, with all due, due respect to all my shareholders, are as important, if not important, than my shareholders. How I treat them, how they live, how they continue to exist as people uh, is uh, as important. What happens in the countries that I operate in is as important as my investors. I have only 10,000 investors, but I have millions of people that I touch as in my community. So, so I'm not going to prioritize that, that one investor over, over another uh, person that actually gets touched by an organization. So CSR, thank you. CSR, CSR needs to be put on the side for a little bit, and we need to think about how companies interact with community, not for PR purposes, so it doesn't become uh, CPR or whatever you want to call it, and it becomes real serious involvement of companies in the community that they operate in. Investing in these communities, either as part and parcel of their business model, or as straightforward contribution. I mean, there's a big story about... Why, 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 does, why? Why, why, is this why? Your, why is this a passion for you? Why? It's a passion because, I, you know, if it's not a passion for me, you should say I'm stupid and you shouldn't invest in me. If I care about... The, look, investors today and clients, if I'm going to be strictly, strictly business-like now, investors and clients and employees of talent will not come work to a company that is not socially socially, sustainably responsible. If I'm a polluter, talented people don't want to work to, for a polluting company. They will go work somewhere else. Investors today are asking me, are you publishing a sustainability report? My big clients today that come from the West will not do business with me. Big oil companies that we do business with, will, will, the first thing they ask me is, show me your sustainability report. Show me what you do about corruption. There is a big question. What do you do about corruption? Mm -hmm. And I need to be transparent. They come and they will check on, with, on me on the ground to see if my people that are clearing customs are doing it the proper way. Because otherwise, they're not going to do business with you. So that's one way of doing it. That, well, that's one, uh, uh, one reason why I am, I, we need to do it from a business. This is good for business. But the other story of it is uh, this... Business is 50% is of labor force, let's say, for, for the sake of, of just throwing a number out, which means we touch half of the population we live in, which means everything we do has an impact on development and on people. So if we're not responsible and interacting with the community that we sell products to, we buy products from, we're not engaging them in a, in, in a very healthy manner. If we, don't, if we live in a society that's miserable and we think we're going to be successful, this is very short-term thinking. Companies that live in miserable societies will not, are not sustainable. So you need to participate in that. And governments today cannot be the only developer, people that are responsible for development. The private sector needs to step up. We are shy in the private sector. We need to step up and say our children cannot have, uh, cannot, the state cannot be the only person responsible for our children. We need to partner. There needs to be a partnership between the state, social entrepreneurs, civil society, and the private sector 
in addressing the very complicated social issues that we face today. Well, I can only say now you know why Fadi Gandor is a legend. Thank you, Fadi Gandor. Thank you.